Hello, welcome. You are watching Insight, Raw premier news show. I'm your head of news, Ian Makungu, he, him, and I'm here to bring you all the news you need to know to go for the next week, and also to share the views of all the students who want to speak about the um, topics we're discussing. Today, we're talking about Brexit. Um, the, government is, the government has faced criticism of their new Brexit bill, which they admit breaks the law in a limited specific way. We see ministers resign, former prime ministers condemn it, and also across the sea, um, almost a bipartisan coalition of politicians have come out against the new bill. Um, in coronavirus, obviously, we've seen new rules come out, the um, rule six, and who's allowed to meet in a, you know, in a household. And we, we'll talk about how it's going to affect you as university students. We're also going to talk about Warwick's own test and trace system, um, which they which they announced, um, which they announced. In a, I'm from a board article about it now in the, the comment section. And of course, most importantly, and for, you know, sort of the biggest story of today, we'll be discussing the Warwick SU's new campaign um, to move term line, um, to move term, um, you know, to move term one online um, for the Warwick Protect Our People campaign. Um, I'm joined by a brilliant host of people. Um, firstly, I want to welcome Noah Keat. Noah, welcome. Hello, great to be here. Noah Keat, he, him. And uh, it's wonderful to be back on uh, the Raw News Facebook page after sort of two and a half, three months away. Yeah, because you were you obviously you hosted your own live stream back in. Uh, yeah, I know that was that seems like so long ago that I did that run of um, nine shows a front page, and I did miss doing it. Like the first few Mondays afterwards, I always felt like I needed to be somewhere. And I was like, oh no, it's stopped. Term um, it's finished. But um, yeah, it, as I say, it's really brilliant to be back here and to talk about you know, the news. Really hasn't gone um, away in terms of its importance. And I don't think it will go away for years and years to come. Yeah, I mean, because it's been a, it's been a, a fairly mad few months since we went off air. I would try and try and list every story we have missed, but it, that's, but you'd be here for the whole hour. Yeah, yeah, I would. There wouldn't would, be enough time yeah, to I'll, debate. I'll yeah. Um, so I'll bring in our, our next guest. Uh, hello, I am Ninu. Uh, he slash him pronouns. I'm so glad to be back. I love discussing the news. I'm a second year economics student at Warwick. And yeah, I'm just excited to delve into the topics that we're going to be discussing today. Yeah, and now Nini, you are sort of our Brexit expert for today, correct? Because you have, and I, you read the entire new Brexit bill, correct? Yeah, I've read every single clause. Something that some, even some MPs have admitted to not doing. Uh, you can't blame them around the 40th clause, you, you don't want to read anymore. <laughs> Oh, well, you know, I guess one thing government's not known for is engaging writing. Well, you know, Ninu, thank you for joining us. Of course, we have a representative from Warwick and Naval. Hello there. Um, I'm Charlotte Lau. I'm a second year pay student. Um, not very experienced on uh, Royal yet, but I'm um, hoping to come on a lot more next year. I'm delighted to be here today um, in my capacity as a role um, as Enable's campaigns officer. You know, Charlotte, we're, we're happy to have you. Um, quickly, before we um, sort of get on to anything else, I want to ask you, could you just um, for a second summarise for us what Warwick Enable is saying about this new SU campaign? Yeah, um, so basically, um, they introduced this campaign a couple of days ago, um, and the immediate thing that we were quite concerned about is that there had been no genuine consultation of uh, any students, but especially disabled students. Obviously, the broad nature of disability um, means that some disabled students will uh, support the decision to move all teaching online, yet many are very concerned about it and they would find it extremely hard or even impossible. Um, so all we really wanted was the chance to discuss with the SU um, the concerns that our members have expressed to us. And this isn't just um, informal conversations. We had a survey earlier this year um, when um, um, we asked our members to say what concerns they might have about online teaching. And many express some very deep concerns. Um, uh, deaf students and um, students that are hard of hearing said that they had numerous concerns um, about l a lack of subtitles on um, online te on, with online teaching. Blind students express concerns. Students with mental health problems um, suggest concerns. Um, uh, overall, it, it, we were just very concerned that the issue have seemingly ignored many of these concerns um, s since we've expressed them. Um, and in the first place, simply just didn't ask. Um, and so we simply want the SU to just take a step back, um, think, speak to students who are concerned and reevaluate their position. Yeah. And um, well, thank you for that, Charlotte. And now last, but of course not least, we have a representative, a representative here from a new student campaign, Put Work Students First. 
Um, good afternoon. Yeah, I'm Cameron Hall from the um, Put Work Students First campaign. Um, you may have seen there's been an open letter going around campus this week um, against the SU's new campaign and the fact that students were not consulted about it. And really, as a students' union, we should have been consulted beforehand. Um, I am with Sebastian Max said the co-leaders of this campaign, the co-authors as well of the open letter. It's great to see the support that we've been getting around campus this week from all sorts of students signing our open letter and really sharing the concerns that they had about this new campaign from the Students' Union. I'm really looking forward to talking about our position today and again really looking forward to having some debates and really hoping we can put our view across and convince you to also sign our open letter. Yeah okay well let's dive right into it and start talking about the Student Union campaign. So on Monday the SU announced their new Protect Our People campaign which essentially laid out three demands. Um, the first demand um, was to restore the sessional tutor budget, which university slashed um, in, you know, in which university slashed end of last year. Um, the next demand was, of course, on rent striking, was the university waive all rents for rent strikers and not, you know, seek to pursue that any further. And of course, it's the most controversial one to move term line on, to move all learning in term one online wherever possible. Um, we sort of heard, we, I can sort of guess Cam and Charlotte's opinions on this. So Noah and then I want to come to you. What, what's your opinion on this? Um, if you want to use... No. Oh, oh uh, yeah, Noah, please. Um, yeah, I was yeah, just yeah. saying, um, I think it depends really on which part of the statement or demands that you're talking about. Um, I think the first two parts of the demand are completely acceptable and exactly what you should be expecting the student union to do. I also think when you look at the third part, when you look at the online learning, it's incredibly important to talk about the intent of the SU. A lot has been said about how students weren't consulted, and that is an egregious error on part of the SU. But it is important to note that, you know, coronavirus is surging right now in the United Kingdom, and we can't take things for granted. We have to be as safe as possible. I think the SU were merely trying to ensure that safety for the student students. Um, I do believe that, yes, it was a rash call and there needs to be a lot more nuance in how they put forth this idea and how they implement it. But I think on paper, simply saying we're going to try to integrate as little in-person teaching as physically possible, I think that is a good idea and a good step for the university as a whole. Yeah, um, Noah, same question to you. Yeah, so obviously there are different parts of what the SU came out to endorse. So on their first point of the uh, sessional teaching budget, I really agree with them on that. Um, obviously, universities had to manage their budgets before and during coronavirus. Now, I'm all for universities investing in new buildings um, and new bits of infrastructure, but ultimately, university is about teaching first. And so I think if that means providing more money to PhD students or maybe a new building, I think that is what should be prioritised. Um, on second point, on waiving the rights of rent i think that needs to be there needs to be more clarity about that over whether they want the university to pay it or um the su to pay it in terms of the money that we pay you to sort of join different societies um because i think it's important to be aware that there it, there are institutions within the university for individuals that fall on financially hard times so i think there does need to be more, more clarity about it over whether the student population as a whole all of us who also have to pay rent should be subsidizing other people when there are um systems within the university to help people that are in financial difficulty um, now on the point of moving teaching online i think you've already seen pragmatism from both sides um like the people that believe that all teach like there should be teaching in person have accepted that lectures will be and should be online for the first term and at the same time you've seen people from the su who have accepted that even though they believe the vast majority of teaching should move online that some teaching like lab, lab sessions um should continue as usual so you have already seen a bit of pragmatism there uh, on the second point, I think there is a, a bit of a disparity, like you've got some people that are always going to be opposed to moving all teaching online, and some people that are more opposed to the fact that students weren't consulted. Now, personally, even if students were consulted and the majority of students supported moving all teaching online for term one, um, I would still be against that. Yes, as um, Nira said, we are seeing rising coronavirus cases, but actual new hospitalizations and new deaths are actually remarkably low compared to where they were in March and April. And while the pandemic hasn't gone away at all, and coronavirus is still really a serious situation. 
youngsters are both far less likely to be affected. And so I think that you know, measure is disproportionate to have no seminars at all. Now, I feel very lucky as a second year student and that I live in Lemmy, so I don't live on campus and that I'm lucky enough to know lots of people. That's going to be far harder for people that have come internationally and that are having to self quarantine for no reason. And it's also going to be far harder for freshers who are more likely to live on campus, have fewer opportunities available um, and not have chances to meet new people. So I think we need to take account of the fact that within the student population, there is a real disparity over whether um, individuals are lucky enough to know people or are going to be socially isolated which could be disastrous for individual mental health and that's something that really has been forgotten throughout lockdown yeah uh no you touched more things there firstly i want to discuss the point of student consultation i think that's one of the big um, I'll, I'll come to you on this cam one of the big arguments in your open letter you mentioned is that you don't feel students were consulted properly on this issue can you expand on that slightly well to be honest the first time that the vast majority of students heard of this campaign was the was like when we first saw on the Facebook page when the Warwick SU first put it out that this was their intention. Now we are a students' union. It is students who are, you know, fundamental to that, and it should be their opinions that lead upon all decisions that the SU take. And I think the thing that's really kind of grated on people is this is such a consequential matter. The whole nature of the way we are going to be taught next year is not something you can change or not something you should as a student's union give an opinion on without really consulting the opinions of your students and i know i was watching um uh, the education officer megan clark's interview um earlier on in the week and she made the point that we can't hold an all-student vote right now and constitutionally within the su bylaws we can't do that right now but these are unprecedented times and that doesn't stop sort of unprecedented measures, whether that be some form of an informal survey taking place. Now, again, Megan made the point as well that yes, the survey could have, you know, potentially caught out and not accounted maybe for more marginalized communities. But as well, that could have been consultation how the liberation societies that could have informed this decision. But the fact is, the fact that no student was consulted on something that is so significant is frankly egregious, really. This is such a vital issue and the fact is you know we we all understand right now that we can't have lectures in person because of coronavirus we all understand right now that social distancing and face masks are going to be required but you know for a lot of students they've made a lot of sacrifices international students you know for example they've left home they've made an immense sacrifice to leave their families in the middle of the global pandemic with the expectation that they'd be coming to university following both the medical advice and university advice that that is what they would be expecting and so to not even be consulted on such a significant matter i think many students have found it rather offensive and rather begun to question whether the su is still representing it's still representing them if on such an important matter they can't even run some form of informal consultation yeah i'm Obviously, I want to touch on the issue of the consultation in a broader sense, but in particular, one thing you said there, um, would you, could it not be argued that the, the suffering that internationals are going through right now is not the SU's fault, but the fault of the university, which failed to make proper uh, sort of accommodations for the fact that for some people, doing this year online will not only be easier, but better? Well, the, the university has been very clear in its approach, and it's been very clear that it's going for a blended approach. And certainly what we have been saying is that there needs to be a choice between students staying fully online and having that face-to-face -face teaching. So students can take that choice if they want to. If for, I know there are international students who haven't come over to the UK at the moment, who haven't had to go through the 14-day quarantine because they feel more comfortable taking their classes fully online. But there are many international students, both friends of mine and from people that I've seen on social media, who have come over to the UK because they fundamentally believe that getting that face-to-face -face teaching, whilst it is advised to be safe, you know, is the best way for them to learn. And, you know, for these students to have their students' union not consult them on something that really could have been avoided. These students, would, international students would not have made the decision to come to the UK and make such significant personal financial sacrifices if they were consulted on this and they knew there was a consultation taking place much longer they may have delayed their delayed themselves coming over to the uk whilst they knew this was coming on and whilst they knew the students were being consulted but again it, the students should have been consulted on such an important matter and i think we've seen with the anger 
over the last few days that with students feeling they haven't been consulted, they're feeling unrepresented by their SU at the moment. And that's really the forefront of our campaign, that we want to make sure that the SU is putting students first in all of their matters. And I think this is on this particular matter, students need to be consulted on something of such high consequence. Um, well, I suppose yes, you would argue that they are putting students first. Um, in, in their in sort of in their opinion, it's sort of inarguable that it's not it is in fact safer to not go into these um, you know schools at all rather than having a mix of blended face to face teaching. Um, and they would say, and they have said that in these extraordinary circumstances, as you said, um, with you know coronavirus cases rising once again, you know what we're seeing from America, where there's a university coming massive breeding down essentially for the coronavirus. Um, they, they're saying, well, we had to take extraordinary measures of just putting out this campaign. Um, well, can I say something as an international student? Oh, yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, um, so yeah, I'm an international student. Um, I'm not in the UK currently. I was supposed to be flying over today, but I will be in five days. And I do agree that it is really annoying that we weren't consulted on this decision. It's a massive decision for us. You know, plane tickets are not cheap in the slightest. And, um, you know, they require, you have to book them in advance, prepare your trip, all of this needs to be done. And I would be disappointed if I landed in England, did my two weeks of quarantine, and then the university said, okay, now you have to just stay inside your house in Lem, and that's where all the teaching will be done. But yeah, many international students aren't coming over. And the, the fact that that is because we're not really sure if campus is safe. I had to deliberate over that decision to come back to the UK for a very long time. Um, we don't know if campus is going to be safe. We don't know if that little bit of in-person teaching that is going to happen is going to be safe. The fact that many, um, the fact that the SU building will sort of be open, the fact that the Terrace Bar, the Dirty Dark are going to be open, these things sort of scare us, right? Because yes, it is less deadly for the age demographic that we are in. The fact that there is there was a positive case in the sports center sort of scares me. It, it is incredibly scary to have to come to this country and then have cases surge. Right now I understand that new deaths are falling, but that's simply because we're less likely to die from it. Right? I, I do think that we should be avoiding in person, we should be avoiding going to campus where we can. I do understand some people don't have that liberty, some people don't have that option but still where where it is possible we should be online again where yeah. it is possible only. um yeah we've had a, a comment in um which says covid does not affect students i like to sort of covid night while students are far less you know people are right to fight like to die of covid or even you know suffer more extreme effects it does affect students and if you does get if you, you get hospitalized it can have long-term health effects we're still exploring the full range of what covid 19 can do um yeah but so Obviously, you, you, you touch upon the fact there. That of course, you people people often would prefer to come back. I think that's not um, up for you know. Everyone would prefer to come back fully. The question is: Is the university COVID secure, and do you trust the fact the university is COVID secure? Uh, yes, me if, if I if I trust that it's uh, COVID secure. Yeah, I don't think any university on the planet is COVID secure right now. And I'll put it just simply like that because. You know, as students, we are bound to socialize. This is going to happen. Yes, I would like to be on campus. Everybody would. But if you're asking me whether it's the safest decision in the world, I have to say no. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cam, do you have any response to that? Well, I think certainly the, the position that I think we've taken is that obviously that the university is trying to mitigate risk as much as possible. But I think certainly, Nini, you raised a, a very interesting point then. You obviously had your opinion, but the fact is the SU didn't really canvas for your opinion. They didn't canvas for anyone's opinion on this. They didn't know what the student body were going to say, and they didn't know what the opinion was on this. And I think fundamentally, when we talk about places being COVID secure, again, what, you know, the, the teaching approach that the university are offering this face-to-face -face model. It's not a resumption of what we had before the pandemic, because we know that's not possible at the moment, but where we can mitigate risk as much as possible. We can't totally eliminate it. That's something that we, we understand. But if you can mitigate it as much as possible, and I think you raised an interesting point, Ninu, about sort of other facilities as well, and the sort of nature of students to socialize. In many ways, 
teaching at the moment is in face to face teaching is going to be much safer potentially than going to a pub, going to a restaurant where, you know, you're lo likely to have a lot more movement in those places, people moving to and from bars, for example. If you are, you know, in a in a teaching setting, for example, whether that be in a lecture theatre or in, say, one of the bigger seminar rooms, we know that there are some seminar rooms on campus, for example, in the humanities building, where this model of blended in-person teaching is unlikely to work just because of the size of the rooms. But if you take the lecture theatres, which are all going to be free, if you take the bigger seminar rooms in places like the Oculus, in the Ramphill building, where students have that choice to come in, where we have social distancing, where we have face masks, where we can mitigate that risk as much as possible, is going to be much safer than a lot of other social settings at the moment. And so in many ways, the other alternative is not to leave your house at all. And that has, as we've also put in the open letter, very significant mental health consequences as, as well. I can speak from my personal experience of my mental health really struggling during lockdown. And I think that's, that's really informed a lot of our approach. But again, the SU needed to consult students upon this and they needed to have an honest conversation. That's why we've also asked the SU to publish who they have been consulting. Did they consult with people who both supported tougher measures? We know they were consulting with the university and colleges union, again, a very heavily politically affiliated union. Are they the only people they consulted? If they have done more consultation with a trade union than with the students they represent, can we really say that Warwick SU is putting stu Warwick students first at the moment? Um, I want to come. To, I want to come to you, Charlotte, for a quick a second. Obviously, in this whole discussion, weren't the university safe and COVID secure? Um, I've had some questions for some people who said that with, with the way coronavirus, coronavirus, you know, deaths are, are often very heavily weighted towards disabled people. Is it really right for the Warwick's, um, you know, disabled disability society to essentially say we want to go back on campus? Well. Um... As our uh, statement quite clearly states, we think that students should be given the choice. Um, um, a number of departments have said that if students feel that the best course of action for them is to do all online teaching, then, um, then they can. And we think that disabled students or any student that feels that coming onto campus would be an issue should be given um, um, the cho choice to learn online. Our position is based on the fact that when we did a survey earlier this year, so many disabled students came forward to us and said that online learning would would pose very difficult challenges to their learning and so we released our statement and took the position that we did to stand up for those students who thinks who think that 100 percent online learning would make their learning extremely difficult or impossible so i fully empathize with students within the disabled community who feel that um in-person teaching would be a massive problem and i say to them do every, contact your department and see if and and try and get them to offer you that option but i also have to say to the members of the disabled community who are really really worried right now that they won't be able to learn effectively and they were, that's why we've released a statement and because we believe that both sides should be listened to and at the moment the issue are not listening to you um and it was it was even more concerning to learn that when the issue released this statement they didn't even do um what's called an equality impact assessment um, which is something we think they should have done for a, for, um, a decision of this magnitude, um, to release a position of this magnitude, um, which basically assesses the impact that any decision or course of action would have on the nine protected characteristics under the um, Equality Act. And though, of course, there would be disabled students who um, would benefit from online teaching, we think that had they done this statement and consulted with the various liberation societies, including Enable, they would have seen that there are a lot of students who are genuinely really concerned and are really angry that they haven't been consulted because this is going to have a really deep and profound impact on their degree, which they're paying over nine thousand pounds for. Um, well, you you mentioned um, the liberation societies there, so um, yeah. of course I feel I have to mention that earlier today. Um, you know, the various liberation societies, including Warwick and Able, released a statement backing the SU's proposition. Um, they saying for the same reason that the university is not COVID secure evidenced by as you saw the out the outbreak at the you know university gym how do you feel about them not supporting this position 
Um, well, obviously, it, I'm sure each Liberation Society has consulted their members like we have um, and reached their position by um, speaking to their members and asking for their concerns. Um, obviously, yes, um, with the nature of the, of the pandemic, it, it, there can't be a 100% guarantee that the campus will be 100% COVID secure. There simply will be um, um, cases that sit through the gaps. But we think with the appropriate measures taken, so much can be mitigated and ultimately disabled students who feel that online learning is extremely problematic difficult or even impossible for them we, we have to stand up for them and basically that they want if those students feel that they want to come onto campus and learn um because the alternative won't work then that, that's why we're standing up for them um i'm sure any student will ultimately have a personal view on this um we we, we obviously can't represent all views um but but ultimately we're standing up for those students who have who have obviously fought extensively about this um and decided that despite the risks that online teaching is the best course of action and uh, three in person some level of in-person teaching is the best course of action for them yeah um now we, we saw this we've all been dancing around mental health aspect of this whole discussion um noah i know you've you've i've seen you talk about this um, in various ways why do you think this is gonna this campaign is going to affect mental health I think uh, looking at mental health is really important and it's all about looking at the hidden costs of lockdown um, that even though it's not as lockdown isn't as severe as it was it's about recognizing that while we went into lockdown to make sure the NHS wasn't overwhelmed there was a cost from that if you're not being able to get cancer treatment stroke treatment or mental health issues now on the specific issues of um, universities just sort of follow up on some of the other points people have made and uh, we looked at sort of safety versus taking a risk and I think it's really important to understand that going to university in or out of a pandemic is always a risk you know there's always a chance that the university experience couldn't work out um, the way an individual wants it to go they could not have a brilliant time there you know life in a sense is all about taking risks and why you can mitigate the risk of coronavirus until there is this vaccine that we hear is still in development and might be in development for a long time we're just going to sort of have to learn to live with it uh, the second point there are brilliant institutions like the open university that exists that deliver fully online teaching but for me fundamentally the university is about human connection you know whether it's through lectures which i hope are able to resume in person from january or through seminars societies like rural or um, you know just moral support as humans develop as adults human connection really is important to university while the internet is brilliant for connecting people online it's not the same as having that in person uh, finally, especially in the UK, we talked a lot about what was seen as essential work and like shamefully, in my view, uh, schools and universities weren't really seen as essential. Now, the government wants to make sure schools can never shut again. But in a way, that should be the same for universities, too, given all the research they do. They should be seen as essential organisations that need to operate. So I think while we're understanded, while it's understandable um, that lectures need to be moved online, the idea that seminars should take place in person as much as possible to educate the next Next generation and allow uh, PhD academics to undertake their research, which will help society as a whole. I think that is really important to strive towards. Yeah. Oh, well, obviously, we lockdown did have a very profound effect on the mental health of people across the nation. I think that people can argue. But surely it can also be said that by limiting in person, especially in the university, let's say just in the university, by limiting in person interaction there, we are mitigating the risk of a second local lockdown in the work area. So that can allow people to socialise outside the university space. Um, then I see uh, nodding your head. Wanna... I do think that would be the case. Um, I think it's important to take the long term view here. I'm not saying that there aren't mental health concerns, and those are incredibly important. I was um, stranded abroad away from my family until about July, and it was incredibly difficult to cope. And lockdown is incredibly difficult for people to deal with, especially people with pre-existing mental health conditions. And I do agree that socialization is an important part of the university experience and that universities are an essential part of the function of society. But at the end of the day, we have to take a long term view on this. Right. If we if we take a few risks here, we are risking a lot. here. There, 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 there's more on the line here than just our mental health there's also our physical health on the line and those two things are equally important but in the long run this will help us reopen sooner 
right? Being more safe now helps the country reopen sooner. And that will have a positive impact on all of our mental health. That'll have a positive impact on the socialization aspect. I think you, uh, someone mentioned, you know, going back to in-person in January, but that's only possible if we slow down the secondary surge that is happening again in the United Kingdom, especially in the West Midlands, right? That's only possible if we slow this down. And yeah, that might mean sacrificing a lot of socialization opportunities right now. That might mean sacrificing a lot and it'll take an incredibly heavy toll on us individually and as a society. But at the end of the day, I guess the question is simply if it's worth it. And obviously everybody's going to have a different answer on that. And the SU should have factored that into their decision. I'm not saying that the SU did the right call by not consulting students, but I'm just saying we have to take a bit of a long run as a perspective on this. Yeah, I suppose in the end, that is really what it does come down to. Um, no matter whatever issue you have, people are upset that they've not been consulted on the issue. Um, so I guess final question to everyone, what can the SU, SU do, to, do to fix this? Shall I, shall I go first on this? Yeah, oh, please, yeah. Um, so I think fundamentally the SU, I think, firstly, obviously you need to answer the demands in our open letter. And again, the open letter is building a lot of momentum and, to the, and for the SU at the moment, to put a little bit of context here, we are currently at 409 signatures. And if this was a normal sort of term where we could be putting motions forward for an all student vote, we've already passed the 1% threshold in terms of signatures that we've got that would normally be allowed to trigger a petition motion, which means that we can put a motion through bypass student council and put it straight to an all student vote. So it's clear that a large proportion of Warwick students are angry at the fact they weren't consulted over this measure and they want to have their voices heard through some form of vote. So firstly, the SU need to address the demands that we put out in our open letter. They need to say why students were not consulted over this. They need to say who they consulted, what opinions they gave, and why they deem those opinions sufficient. And they need to lay out if we do have to move to online teaching, and if that, if that is what, if this was to go to a vote and students vote for online teaching, if that's what students want, then we need to ask what support is being put in place for students mental health especially for freshers right now this is a very difficult time for freshers moving away from home they need to be able to have confidence that their mental health is going to be monitored and helped by the su we need them to also ask what support they're giving to international students and also what support they're giving to disabled students and other marginalized communities on campus but for, but really the most important thing right now is with the signatures that we're building up, we're showing that a large number of work students from across all sorts of different groups, all sorts of different societies, all sorts of courses, all sorts of year groups, they're asking for their opinions to be heard. The SU need to consult students, whether that's informally right now, or putting it to a vote when we get back to campus and term starts again. As I said, if this was term time and we were putting it through as a petition motion, we would have the numbers to automatically trigger an all student vote. Students want to have their opinions consulted on such a consequential matter, and the SU need to grant that. Yeah. Uh, Carol, I, I know I've said it was the last question, but you actually do remind me of the question I wanted to ask. Um, so, obviously, we discussed a lot about students in this, you know, obviously, we are all students, so that's our primary concern. But it is, um, of course, you know, the SU can talk with UCU because if you go back to face to face teaching, Teachers will be in danger as well. Teachers tend to be older; they tend to be in, you know, the in you know, in the categories of people who are in, at risk from COVID. Do we think it's fair to force them to go back into potentially unsafe workplaces? Well, I th I think we need to again. We need to leave optionality at the moment. That's the mo most important thing that people have a choice now. I, I, a lot of it really depends on what you see the university as, but certainly we are paying over nine grand for a university education. And I think provided we can mitigate risk as much as possible. Now we do know, yes, there is a potential, the, the risk for a potentially worse coronavirus illness is greater in older people. But if we can mitigate that risk as much as possible with social distancing, with face masks, with making sure that any in-person teaching is held in large ventilated rooms, whether that be lecture theatres, whether that be the larger seminar rooms on campus, 
the fact is a lot of students at the risk to of spreading coronavirus would be significantly less in a controlled environment like that than in an environment say like the dirty duck or t-bar where there's a higher propensity for students to be socializing amongst themselves and so provided that we can mitigate that risk and it's clear from the guidelines that the university are putting out and from sage as well that if those controlled covid secure protocols are in place then this can be done as safe as possible and so ultimately the su have a responsibility to stand up for its students it's a students union yes it can consult the opinions of others but it fundamentally has to put work students first and we need to be having that constructive dialogue with the university to making sure we're mitigating risk as much as possible that we're getting the opinions of students and lecturers consulted but ultimately we're going ahead with what is the best for the university and what is uh, the opinion that puts students first and what students want if we can have covid safe protocols in place which we are then really you know we need to be having students consulted and having them represented by the su yeah, um cam thank you um charlotte would you like to have a final word on you know this, this whole issue yeah yeah um ultimately um we just think that the su have rushed into this decision far too much um i'm delighted that Certain SU officers, such as Isabel, who's the current disabled students officer, uh, Luke Mepp and the president, um, and a number of other SABs as well, um, they all said that um, the statement shouldn't have been released. Um, and I'm delighted and delighted that they did. Um, but it's also very concerning that the SU, this, this was clearly a divisive issue to the extent that it divided the officer team. I'm, 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 it's just very concerning that they kind of rush into it like that without taking a step back to do an equality impact assessment, to consult disabled students, to consult international students, to effectively um, consult anyone. Um, we just think that the issue sh should at this point um, take that step back that they should have done at first, finally do some consultation. Um, and, if the issue, and I'm sure the issue will still remain extremely divisive um, and, and, and they should proceed and do some kind of uh, student democracy to develop to, to determine the final say um my view is that should be for an all student vote um as it was mentioned earlier yes um SU bylaws say that all student vote can't take place during um outside of term time these are unprecedented times um and this is an, an issue that i'm sure no one anticipated um so that's what the issue should do um and um enable have discussed with um body such as Warwick UCU's own disability secretary and um, we have representatives on the disability task force um, and they all share our concerns that some disabled students are really deeply affected by this um, decision to um, move all teaching on um, to, for the call to move all teaching online um, so ultimately going forward enable will continue to uh, hear and um, stand up for the concerns of disabled students. Um, we think the issue have made a very grave mistake by not consulting anyone, um, especially marginalised communities they're mandated to represent. Um, and um, I hope that they can, that they do take this step back and um, finally listen to students, which I'm, I'm afraid to say they simply have not done. Yeah. Well, um, Charlotte, Cam, thanks so much for coming on. Um, if you want to find out more about Work, work Enable, please, um, you can find them on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And of course, uh, Cam, I believe your campaign is also on um, the Put Work Students First campaign is also has a Facebook page and a Twitter account. Yes, we do. And also, please sign our open letter as well. I'm going to attach it to the comments page of this post. It's on our Facebook. It's on our Twitter page as well. But make sure you give both pages a like to keep updated. And most importantly, if you agree that students need to be consulted on this matter, please sign and share this, share our open letter. Yeah, well, thank you both for coming on. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Um, just, just to be uh, clear, in case someone's out there, we're, um, we're does not endorse any open letter at all. We are politically neutral on this topic. Um, also, I, well, I cannot confirm whether or not um, other sub I mean, other sub officers have come forward and said their piece on the campaign. I do have a statement here from the disabled students officer who says, "I think the the campaign as a whole is well intentioned, but I staunchly disagree with the way the decision came about and made this very clear throughout the decision making process. I was not alone in this position." Um, and there was. Um, 
um, which is like that's her statement. That's uh, you know what we have, and I can't confirm any of her statements. Um, so moving on from the you know that debate to the less controversial topics of Brexit and coronavirus. <laughs> no complication at all. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure we can. I feel like we can solve those problems in uh, 21 in minutes. minutes. Yeah, yeah we can. easy. We can do that. Yeah. I don't know what's government's worrying about. This is easy. Um, yeah, so um, let's start with obviously the new coronavirus, leg- um, you know, leg- uh, you know, regulations. Everyone's been getting yeah. so upset about um, the rule of six, uh, as it was, is that you basically you cannot meet at, within your household bubble. You can only have a, a group of six people, any any group gathering, whether that's inside or outside, which is a drop from the previous 30, 30 people per gathering. Um, can I say before we get into anything? The fact that it was like 30 people astonishes me. I don't know how that slipped past me in this entire... I've been covering, you know, this whole issue for months now, and I did not know whatsoever. Um, Noah, Nini, I'd like to come to you. What are your opinions on this? Um, Noah, you go first. I think there's been a real lack of clarity as we've eased lockdown over what's been guidance, what the government have guided people to do, and what has been enforceable through law for the police to prosecute people. So the government could guide people to socially distance and, you know, not spend time with multiple households. But initially, until that's actually in law, the police or whatever organisation are unable to enforce that. And so the rule of six has garnered such attention because it has officially become into law. And we've seen recently that it's even stricter in places like the North East where they introduce the curfew. Um, I think this rule of six idea is sort of both unenforceable and undesirable and you've seen a real lack of um, clarity and messaging from government ministers over what individuals should do if they're looking over their gardens and see a large uh, garden party taking place or they go to a park and see a gathering of 20 people sitting in a circle. You've had some ministers saying that people should report them to the police and other ministers saying, like like the Prime Minister Boris Johnson himself, saying that you should go over to the group and speak to them yourself um, before phoning the police. Now, I'm, I personally, I go jogging, I see large gatherings that are well over six. I am not going to go and speak um, to those different people and say that they should disperse. I don't have the power to do that. Um, I would feel unsafe doing that. I'd feel more unsafe doing that than going near them and potentially catching coronavirus. And I think it is a real sort of shame that we've separated these, you know, all these different people apart and different families that haven't seen one another for months and now being told you can't see um, each other again. And it's sort of in direct contradiction to the government's other messages, A, the brilliant eat out to help out scheme in August. It was a brilliant scheme because it gave people the, the impression that the government was paying for half of their meal. Well, governments have no money. They only get their money from taxpayers. So it was the taxpayer that was paying that debt. As we're seeing the national debt increasing day after day after day. You had the success of the Eat Out to Help Out scheme, which was encouraging people to go out in groups to restaurants. And also the government's messaging that people should return to offices so that, um, say, if, you're, if you live in London, Zone 1 offices where many people might work um, can receive, you know, receive business and shops around that area that receive so little business during the height of the pandemic can do well again. So you've seen a real contradiction with the idea of going back to school, going back to workplaces, at the same time saying people shouldn't mingle. It's now illegal to mingle. Well, what on earth does that mean? These these laws that are coming to place are very little scrutiny and they're undesirable. They go against the government's own messaging and even the government can't agree over what someone should do if they see a gathering of 50 people. Uh, well, I, I, from my understanding of the rules of mingling, that would mean that, to take your earlier example, if you went over to a group of people violating the coronavirus rules and spoke to them, you would then bec- yourself become in violation of the coronavirus yeah, rules. Yeah, uh, it's not my... Like, Patel mentioned it, she used the example yeah. of... Um, yeah, right. I was using the example of the if you have a family of four and a family of seven family of four and they met up and they sort of caught saw each other, you know, walking on the road, they start to have a conversation, that would then be in violation of the rules. Um so I, I guess Nino, I want to come to you obviously. You're you are you are not in England right now, so you have a sort of international perspective on this. What, what do you think about these new regulations? I think I don't understand how anybody is surprised. I, I don't understand how the government is surprised that they've had to take these steps. Um, essentially, the way I see it is, uh, Britain locked down. They were doing incredibly badly, but they locked down and they started to get better. And with time, they got a lot better. And now what the government said is, okay, guys, go back to work, go back to school. You can take public transport again. Yes, with a face mask, but you can take public transport again. Go back to restaurant, make sure you buy their stuff and we'll give you a discount over it. And you can mingle with up, up to 30 people now. And then they're surprised when the cases surge again 
and then they have to cut it back down to six and they have to say oh you can't do this anymore you can't do that anymore but offices schools and restaurants remain open pubs remain open so what if i mingle with six people in a field i might get coronavirus but if i see those same six people in a classroom immediately after that or before that there's no risk factor then i Honestly, it doesn't make any sense to me. The legislation is completely vague about what constitutes illegal activity and what doesn't, what I'm supposed to do in the, in, in the event of illegal activity. And if you really feel like ordinary citizens are going to A, confront people to stop an illegal gathering, or B, call the police on an illegal gathering, I think you are fairly misguided about human behavior. A, there's no chance if I see a big gathering going on, I'm going to go there and stop them because that's just how the human psychology works. We don't want to, we don't want to ruin their enjoyment just because the government's told us not to. And also we don't want to catch the disease ourselves. It makes no sense. And I don't think there's even a lot of clarity about what the punishment on violating these regulations are, right? I don't know what the punishments are. I don't think there's consistency in them. And I don't think the public, as a whole really knows what's going on. And that can't be a, spy, a strong sign of a, of a strong democracy, can it? Um, well, just to clarify that then, um, the current rulings is as far as I can see is that if you are caught violating these rules, you'll be fined on your first offense, a hundred pounds, and then doubling of each further offense up until 3,200 pounds. Um, so essentially basically a student, a student loan really. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, so obviously you, you complain these, these the rules don't seem logical don't seem nonsensical um the government's facing lots of you know sort of delayed backlash from their rules um we've seen that testing centers have been under basically undersupplied there are not enough tests to go around um and there's now been word going around that we have to have a second lockdown because that because of that failure what do you think about that well, I say we're already in a second lockdown when it's, as I said earlier, about in the northeast, the fact there is a curfew or when people can go out and about. This is not usually the thing you see in free liberal democratic societies. Curfews are what happen in totalitarian dictatorships. So once again, we're seeing the state impose more and more of its power on different areas. Obviously, Leicester was the first area that was known to go into some sort of second lockdown. We're seeing it once again in Bolton in Greater Manchester. And so all around the country, I think I've seen in the news, it's about 10 million people that are under some form of extended lockdown. And I think this is really unsustainable for local businesses. You know, they are based on having been able to reopen in June or July, already lost so much money with the first national lockdown um, between March and June, and are desperately trying to stay open and survive. And the Eat Out to Help Out scheme, uh, if they're like a hospitality place serving food, that may have temporarily helped them, but it's not going to be enough to have to shut again. Um, similarly, I just don't think it's sustainable for schools to keep open, opening and closing. I don't think schools should be allowed to close ever again. I think the education of children should be seen as an essential service, just as essential as going to the supermarket to get food. And I also don't think it is sustainable for who we are as humans. You know, we are social individuals. We like meeting up and gathering with people. And I don't think it's sustainable for us to be put back into hibernation, back into our own houses once again um, every three months, every time cases surge even when the new daily deaths and new daily hospitalizations are at an all-time low and the nhs is going to be overwhelmed it won't be from coronavirus it'll be from all the stroke patients all the cancer patients all the mental health patients that haven't been seen and that have been completely neglected uh, since march yeah um Lily, i guess I'll, I'll come back to you again uh, how are you going to feel if you come to the uk and you end up being forced to go through lockdown in the house with me um, honestly, that's exactly what I'm expecting to happen. I do expect a second lockdown, especially in the West Midlands. I think Birmingham and Solihull have already started new regulations, and I'm incredibly upset about it. I find lockdown laws, you know, incredibly draconian and restricting. But you know, they're they're sort of necessary in times like these, I suppose. Um, it's kind of sad that. Unfortunately, many people could still violate them and get away with it. But, you know, the, the England only started doing better after the first lockdown. And I, but I don't think a second lockdown is going to solve anything if their reopening plan is exactly the same as the reopening plan they had after the first lockdown. 
you know, I think um, the fact that we're surging again has shown not just recklessness on part of the British people who are, you know, having these illegal gatherings, but of the British government as a whole in the legislation about it, in in what exactly they prioritized while reopening. I think this, if there is a second lockdown, they need to relook at it and completely change their strategy going forward. Yeah. Yeah, well, I guess, um, what else could I do? We'll move on to coronavirus. We do only have 10 minutes left. I do want to talk about Brexit, an issue that we can surely get through in 10 minutes. We are really going to, this is going to be fine. Mm -hmm. So, Ninu, as our Brexit correspondent, I'm going to come to you. Explain exactly what's going on with the new internal market bill. Okay, so for those of you that don't know, uh, the internal market bill was recently proposed in the parliament and um, it did win the vote, I believe, which apparently was not surprising because of Boris Johnson's majority in the parliament. Now, essentially, this bill is um, factoring in um, how trade will work within the United Kingdom, within the four nations of the United Kingdom, following Brexit and just in the, from the future, going forward. Now, um, for those of you who are unaware of what's going on with Brexit right now, we are currently in a transitionary period. So from now, or um, from whenever Brexit day was, I've forgotten what day it was now, um, to the end of the year, we're in a transitionary period where we are still bound by European Union law and trade regulation. Um, following this, we will exit it and either with or without a deal with the European Union. Boris Johnson has expressed his intent to finalize a deal before October 15th. So after October 15th, if there is no deal on the table, then the UK will leave the European Union with no deal, right? So this bill was recently passed in Parliament and it sort of concerns how uh, the countries within the United Kingdom treat with each other. And more specifically and more controversially, it has a specific protocol about Northern Ireland and how it plans to run the border with the Republic of Ireland, which is obviously that and the Good Friday Agreement is a highly contentious part of Brexit. So this bill splits into six parts, right? Now, parts one through four aren't ex extremely uh, controversial. So one and two basically just say that if you're selling a good in one nation of the UK, you should be allowed to sell it in another nation of the UK. And the other one basically says that um, no nation in the UK can discriminate against another nation's products on the basis of it being from that nation, right? So non-discrimination and mutual recognition. I completely agree with these principles. They would integrate the British economy far better. The third part is talking about recognition of professional qualifications. So if you are in a profession, let's say an architect that has a you know, a legal regulation, you know, you have to have a license or, you know, your professional regulated by law. They're saying if you have the qualifications in uh, one nation of the UK, you should be able to get those qualifications in another nation. You shouldn't be discriminated just because you are from one nation in the UK. And then the fourth part, which I found a bit weird, was uh, setting up an office for the internal market under the... Um, competition and markets authority that's essentially going to regulate this and they have enforceable investigatory powers to look into these matters and make sure that there is no discrimination going on basically just enforcing it and part five is the northern ireland protocol which i'll get into last because that's the contentious part of it and part six is the financial assistance which just you know undergoes how this will be financed and things like that now let's talk about part five the northern ireland Basically, um, Northern Ireland has been a very contentious part of the withdrawal agreement between England, uh, I mean, the United Kingdom and the European Union. Essentially, EU law states that um, any EU country has to have a hard border with a non-EU country. But this would go in violation, but the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland having a hard border would go in violation of the Good Friday Agreement, which obviously was enacted for a multitude of historical reasons that we probably shouldn't yeah that we probably shouldn't get into right now so essentially what they've said is that northern ireland is going to continue using eu rules for now and so they they don't have to have a hard border with the republic of ireland and then um there will be 
the division between EU and non-EU will happen from the Northern Ireland into the rest of the other United Kingdom nations, thereby sort of separating Northern Ireland's economy from the rest of them. So there have been two big um, criticisms of this. The first of which is that it completely violates international law. Um, for this, you'd have to look at clauses 42 through 45 of the Internal Markets Bill. And more specifically, essentially, what it is saying, those clauses say, is that um, members of the parliament and whoever's in charge, basically, can ignore their legal obligations under domestic and international law and essentially apply whatever sex they feel is important and relevant, right? So they can whatever, um, essentially, they can do, they, they can make regulations that follow whatever they want to do, regardless of international law. And this violates the exit deal with the European Union. This is incredibly important because it's in violation of Article 26 of the Vienna Convention of the Law of Treaties, um, Pacta San Servanda, which means agreements must be kept. They're violating the good faith of the agreement with the European Union, which is incredibly, you know, which goes against the Vienna Convention laws of treaties of which the United Kingdom is a ratified signatory. And it goes against international law completely, and it's complete farce. And that brings us up to today. Thank you, Nilu. That was probably more in depth than the university audience needed. Um, but that was good. That was, um, frankly, Tara, you, you know far too much about this bill. I'm sort of scared on, on a very <laughs> honest level. Um, so to summarize that summary, um, the new Brexit bill that George Wants presenting um, is essentially, last year, Boris Johnson made a Brexit deal that put a hard border on the Irish Sea. The new bill says that's a terrible idea. Let's scrap that. Um, now, if you were listening to Insight last year, we did in fact discuss this and we said that's a terrible idea. He's going to scrap that. And here we are. Um, now, we've seen condemnation from figures from within Boris Johnson's own party, from former prime ministers and from across the ocean. Do we think Boris is going to back down? Um, I don't think so. Um, I think he'll use this as part of his strategy to try and get this agreement by the 15th of October. Whenever you have any sort of negotiations, it gets nearer and nearer to the deadline. Both sides sort of ratchet up the tension. And so therefore, if they do manage to get this free trade agreement, whether it be anything that Brexit is at most in 2016 actually want, I don't know. But it means that the internal market bill is sort of just academic and theoretical. It never actually has to come in uh, into force. But I think it has been affected by the fact that the transition period that's, that ends at December 2020, that was written with the assumption that the UK would leave in March 2019, and so we'd have 21 months in which to negotiate a free trade agreement. Now, as it happens, we only left at the end of January 2020, so the fact we have 10 fewer months to negotiate this agreement may have had an impact along with coronavirus. And as you say, we were talking about this agreement that Boris Johnson struck. I think it's easily forgotten that this deal, which puts a border in the um, you know Irish Sea, means the Conservatives can hardly call themselves uh, the Conservatives and Unionist Party, but it was an agreement that the EU originally wanted, uh, but it was something that Theresa May, the former Prime Minister, said no British Prime Minister could accept. Yet yeah, Boris Johnson accepted that because it looked good for him. Uh, Theresa May voted for this agreement, so clearly she was able to accept it. And I think because um, the last the election last year was framed as a Brexit versus no Brexit election, it meant that his legislation wasn't actually scrutinised. A final bit, some people have said it's fine to break international law because it should be individual the laws and the sovereignty of individual countries that should matter. Now, the withdrawal agreement was made between individual sovereign countries, the UK, which is a sovereign nation, and the EU, which is made up of 27 sovereign nations. So it's not that international law has a primacy, it is the laws of sovereign countries, and it makes the UK look terrible on the world stage and vastly reduces our soft power if we can't be seen to adhere to treaties to which we've negotiated. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think, if you ask me, I think uh, Boris has to back down if he wants to have any de deal with the European Union because he's just openly violated good faith of, the good faith of that exit agreement, as I've mentioned, in at least three articles of the Vienna Convention. So I think, you know, and there's only, what, a month left for the before the date of which he wants to have an agreement ready. I think if he stands any chance of getting the EU to agree with him on anything right now, he needs to scrap this and send out a public apology over it. And that is all we have time for today. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you both. Thank you, Noah. Thank you, Nini, for coming thank on. You thank you for having us. Um, I, well, I'm sure we'll be back talking 
more about Brexit and coronavirus very soon because nothing ever changes. Um, yeah, thank you both for coming on. Uh, thank you, Gavin. Uh, so that is the end of today's insight. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you everyone who's you know, followed along, and commented. Um, we um, we hope to be back soon. We should be back, you know, um, with Welcome Week. We hope to be back then. But also, if you enjoyed this and you want to say maybe get involved and get involved in raw shows, please um, join the raw Facebook group. There's a link in the description of this video, and you'll get um, join the groups and get involved. Um, thank you for watching.